It is my great, great pleasure to introduce an amazing woman. Uh, we are so lucky to have Melanie Joy. She is a Harvard-educated psychologist, professor, professor of psychology and sociology at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, a celebrated speaker and an author of the award-winning Primer on Carnism, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows. She's been featured on programs including the BBC, National Public Radio, PBS, ABC Australia, and Good Morning Croatia. Dr. Joy, I love it. It's Good Morning Croatia. It's so cool. <laughs> Um, Dr. Joy is the founder and president of Carnism Awareness and Action Network, a new organization. And we are so lucky to have Dr. Joy. Please welcome Melanie Joy. Thank you. Thank you. It is, uh, thank you. It is such a pleasure to be here. I was just, I was telling Hope earlier, I, I'm, I've been on this international speaking tour, this is my third year now, and I've been giving this Carnison presentation um, around the world, um, including on Good Morning Croatia, and, um, and people keep saying to me, I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, have you spoken in Berkeley? Have you gone to Berkeley yet? It's like the one place that's always coming up. And I always say, well, no, I haven't. The opportunity hasn't come up at the right time. And I've always wanted to come speak here more than anywhere else, actually, in the whole world. So I am so excited to be here today. So thank you all so much. And now that I've been here and have gone for a run and spent a little bit of time here, I kind of want to move here. But that's a whole other, that's a whole other conversation. So. <laughs> Did you have a chance to look at some of these slides I had looping there? Aren't they just lovely? Yes. Really, like whenever I make new slides, I always say this, you know, it just takes so long to find just the right images that convey the essence of what I'm trying to communicate. But not when it comes to images depicting the natural connections so many of us have with animals. And especially the connection children have with animals. I always find way more than I can use. I mean, there are literally thousands of pictures out there that really capture that childlike sense of wonder, that understanding, you know, that caring. And I can tell a lot of you can relate to this. Um, so because I'll be referring to this human-non-human relationship throughout this presentation, I want to actually just do a quick exercise with you to explore it a bit more fully. I'd like you to try to think of one or more animals in your life who you have felt a connection to. And by connection, I mean anything from identifying with an animal or animals to loving them. I simply mean caring about their well-being. Maybe it was the horse you took riding lessons on or the guinea pig in your elementary school classroom. Maybe it was the dog you grew up with or a hurt bird you rescued. Or maybe it was a, a fish or a turtle. All right, now I want to take a poll. Raise your hand if you were able to think of at least one animal. Okay, that was easy. More than one animal. All right, now raise your hand if you have ever felt cared about or loved by an animal. And take a look around the room. That is a whole lot of love. <laughs> and our experience tells us something important. We care about animals. We feel connected to them. We can see examples of this everywhere. We teach our children to be kind to animals, not to harm them. We make animals the heroes of our children's stories and the stars of their shows. When we're walking in the woods and we catch a glimpse of a deer through the trees, or when we see dolphins leaping out of the ocean, or when we notice a delicate butterfly resting on a flower, we often feel that, that sense of awe that makes us just stop and speak in hushed voices and watch with what some might even call reverence. When we hear of an abused or mistreated animal, we recognize the injustice and we feel outraged. When we're at the petting zoo and the piglet chooses our hand to eat out of, we feel special, we get excited. Can you relate to some of these feelings? I, mean, I know, I certainly can. So before we get started, I want to tell you just a little bit about me and my story and how I came to be here today. This is, can everybody see okay or is my head in the way? This is a picture of um, me, I just can't see. This is a picture of me and my dog Fritz. Uh, a long time ago now. My mother tells me we adopted Fritz when he was about two months old and I was about two years old. So we were really both just babies when we met. 
And Fritz was my first dog, but he was also my first friend. We did everything together. We played together, we napped together, and we even threw up together once <laughs> during a sickening summer road trip. I'm not making that up. And Fritz was also my first heartbreak when he died at the age of 13 of liver cancer. And what I didn't realize back then was that Fritz, um, or more accurately, my connection with Fritz, would be the catalyst for my life's work. And that's what brings me here today. My life's work as a professor, author, and psychologist has centered around one key theme. It's a theme that's central to our freedom of choice and therefore to our personal empowerment and to social and ecological justice. And that theme is making the connection. So I'm here to talk about our connection with other beings, and with ourselves, and with our core values, and about the invisible belief system, the ism, that disconnects us from these fundamental aspects of our lives. I'm here to talk about how this ism creates a gap in our consciousness when it comes to some of the most frequent and important choices we make, our food choices and how this gap ultimately causes us to, get to act against our own interests and the interests of others. So I'm here with a goal, which is simply to raise awareness of this invisible ism to promote personal empowerment and social and ecological justice. Now, this presentation will be in three parts. First, we will talk about the problem, the gap. What exactly is this gap in our consciousness, and how does it obstruct our freedom of choice? Next, we'll talk about the underpinnings of the gap. What causes and maintains this gap that guides our food choices? And what are its consequences on ourselves and our world? And how does this gap reflect an ism that is, in fact, a social justice issue? And finally, because everybody likes a happy ending, including me, we will talk about the solution to the gap. How could we resolve this gap in our consciousness to make more empowered and just choices? And how can we work to transform this ism that's interconnected with so many of the other isms? So let's get started. What is this gap I have been talking about? Now, to help explain this issue, I'd like to do a brief exercise with you. I'd like you to imagine that you are the guest at a dinner party and the host is famous for her homemade pasta and meatballs. And she serves you a dish that looks like this. Now I'd like you to consider whether you would find this dish delicious or disgusting. Now for those of you who would find it delicious, which are maybe not the majority here, but my guess is a good chunk of people in this room, imagine that you find it so delicious that you ask the host for her recipe. And flattered she replies, well, the secret is in the meat. You need to start out with three pounds of extra lean golden retriever. It's my favorite part of the presentation. <laughs> I wish I could just get a picture when I do that. So just take a moment to reflect on your thoughts and feelings. And chances are what you thought of just moments ago as food, you now think of as a dead animal. Chances are what you just felt was delicious, you now feel is disgusting. Chances are your experience of the meat dramatically changed, even though nothing about the meat itself actually changed. So what is it that changed? Well, what changed is simply your perception of the meat. Now, our perception is the lens that we look at the world through. And when it comes to eating animals, our perception is shaped largely, if not entirely, by our culture. In meat-eating cultures around the world, people tend to have a tiny handful of animals out of thousands of possible species that they've learned to classify as edible. All the rest we classify as inedible and disgusting to consume. And so even though the type of species consumed changes from culture to culture, members of all cultures tend to find their own choices to be rational and the choices of other cultures to be irrational and disgusting and often even offensive. So what's striking is not the presence of disgust. Disgust is the norm, it's the rule rather than the exception. What's striking is the absence of disgust. Why are we not disgusted by the five, six, seven, maybe eight, if you're an adventurous eater, species that we've been taught to think of as edible? And perhaps even more importantly, why don't we ever ask why? Have you ever wondered why you might eat chicken's wings, but not swan's wings? Leg of lamb, but not leg of kitten? They both come from baby animals. 
Have you ever wondered why you might eat beef stew, but not guinea pig stew? You getting hungry? You can tell by your expressions here. <laughs> Clam chowder, but not frog chowder. Hen's eggs, but not pigeon's eggs. Have you ever wondered why you might drink cow's milk, but not horse's milk? And have you ever wondered why you haven't wondered? When it comes to edible animals, there is a disconnect. There is a gap in our perceptual process. There's a gap in our consciousness. We don't make the conscious connection between the meat on our plate and the living being it once was. When I was growing up, I was the picky eater in my family, and in my house there was a rule that no one could leave the table until their plate was clean. And so not surprisingly, this often led to some late night standoffs between me and my mother. So my mother would try not to let me out of her sight, and I would wait for just the right moment when she wasn't looking to slip my food to Fritz, my partner in crime who was stationed under the table. And if my mother happened to catch me, I would tell her I was just petting the dog. And she would believe me, because there were plenty of times when I really was just petting the dog. And over the course of so many years and so many meals, I never thought about how strange it was that I could be petting my dog with one hand while I ate a pork chop with the other. A pork chop that had once been an animal who was at least as intelligent and sensitive and conscious as my dog. I never thought about the inconsistencies in my attitudes and behaviors toward these animals because, you know, to be honest, when I was eating the pork chop, I didn't actually think I was eating an animal. I mean, sure, I knew on some level that whenever I ate meat, someone had to die for my plate. But on another level, I just didn't connect the dots. I just had that, that knowing without knowing. There was a gap in my consciousness. So because this gap in our consciousness blocks our awareness of the reality of our meat, it also blocks our authentic thoughts and feelings about our meat. Remember when I told you you were eating golden retriever balls? That was gross. <laughs> Doubly gross. When I thought, told you you were eating a golden retriever, chances are you couldn't help but think of a living animal and feel disgusted, right? But when you believed yourself to be eating the flesh of a cow, chances are you had no thought of the living animal and felt no disgust. And so when we're not aware of the reality of our meat or of our authentic thoughts and feelings about our meat, then we are also not aware that we have a choice, that we are making a choice every time we eat meat and eggs and dairy. And so this gap in our consciousness robs us of our ability to make our choices freely. Because without awareness, there is no free choice. For much of my life, I never questioned my choice to eat pigs and chickens and cows and their flesh, their excretions, their eggs, because I never even thought I had a choice. No one had ever asked me if I wanted to eat animals, how I felt about eating animals, if I believed in eating animals. No one had ever encouraged me to reflect upon this daily practice that had such profound ethical dimensions and personal implications. Eating animals was just a given. It was just the way things are. But if you think about it, it's just striking that our culture teaches us to spend more time thinking about what brand of shampoo to buy than about what species of animals we eat and why, when our food choices have such a significant impact on our bodies, our minds, and our world. And our food choices truly are a matter of life and death. So now that we've talked a little bit about what this gap is, we can turn our attention to the next set of questions, which is, you know, where does it come from and what are its consequences? It was half a lifetime before I started asking these questions. It was 1989, and I'd recently awoken to find myself hooked up to IV antibiotics at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, after having eaten what turned out to be my very last hamburger. According to my team of doctors, Beth Israel is a teaching hospital, so to my humiliation, I was assigned a cluster of young, good-looking interns who were fascinated by my intestinal activity, and I will say nothing more than that. 
And according to the Department of Public Health, which shut down the greasy spoon I had made the mistake of patronizing, I'd eaten a hamburger contaminated with Campylobacter, which is a foodborne bacteria similar to Salmonella. Some of you are nodding. Have you had this? All right. Some of you know what I'm talking about. A lot of you don't. Okay. All right. So just imagine like the worst gastrointestinal flu you've ever had times 10. And that's what Campylobacter was like, felt like to me anyway. So contracting Campylobacter was truly one of the worst experiences of my life. But it was also one of the best experiences of my life. It was a turning point for me. Before I got sick, I had been exposed to information about the horrors of animal agriculture. You know, I, I just, and I had been not ready to take that information in, you know? So my response had always been, don't tell me that, you'll ruin my meal. But I knew on some level that feeding animals was antithetical to my core values. Like most people, I cared about animals and I didn't want them to suffer. Especially when that suffering was so intensive and so completely unnecessary. But after I got sick, you know, the Campylobacter, you could say, really lit a fire under my butt. Um, I just, I never wanted to eat another hamburger or, or any meat again. And so I didn't. And then something interesting happened to me. When I stopped eating animals, I made the connection. I had a shift of consciousness, a, a paradigm shift. In other words, I didn't see different things. I saw the same things differently. Remember how different your meat looked to you when you thought it was from a golden retriever? Well, that's how all meat suddenly looked to me. It's just interesting how the gaps in our consciousness only become visible when they start to disappear. And as the gap in my consciousness closed, my mind opened. I wanted to learn the truth about animal agriculture. It was a truth that had been right in front of me, it had been all around me, but that I had been unable or unwilling to see. And I wanted, I needed to understand how, when it came to eating animals, rational, caring people, just like myself, could, in the words of psychiatrist and social activist Robert J. Lifton, just stop thinking. And so I spent about 20 years looking for answers, including about a decade of research that culminated in my doctoral dissertation on the psychology of eating meat. And what I found was to dramatically change the way that I and others working in psychology and social justice thought about this issue. So to share my findings with you, I want to do another quick exercise. If vegetarian is the term we use to describe an individual who follows the tenets, the teachings of the belief system we call vegetarianism, vegan is the term we describe someone, used to describe somebody who follows the tenets of veganism, what then do we use to describe somebody who is not a vegetarian or vegan? Okay, good, yes, and not somebody who's read my book, that's all, please, thank you. So somebody said omnivore, right? Yeah, well, now we have so many new terms, right? Pescatarian, flexitarian. Probably the most common ones still today are omnivore, carnivore, and somebody else said meat eater, right? But let's, let's look at these terms. I mean, an omnivore, by definition, is an animal, human or non-human, who can ingest both flesh and plant matter, right? And a carnivore is an animal who needs to ingest flesh in order to survive. Both omnivore and carnivore describe one's biological predisposition, not one's ideological or philosophical choice. And meat eater describes a behavior as though it's divorced from a belief system. And this is why we don't call vegans plant eaters, because we recognize that the behavior of eating plants reflects a deeper belief system or, or ideology. I mean, most people tend to assume it's only vegans and vegetarians who bring their beliefs to the dinner table. But most of us don't learn to eat pigs but not dogs, for instance, because we don't have a belief system when it comes to eating animals. When eating animals is not a necessity for survival, then it is a choice. And choices always stem from beliefs. So what I found is that there is an invisible belief system that conditions us to eat certain animals. And this is the belief system that I came to call carnism. It's essentially the opposite of veganism. 
Now, carnism is a special kind of belief system or ideology. It's a dominant ideology. That means it's invisible, entrenched. It shapes norms, laws, beliefs, behaviors, etc. And it's also a violent ideology. Meat cannot be procured without killing. Dairy and eggs cannot be procured without harming, and often include extensive killing. And dominant violent ideologies such as carnism need to use a set of social and psychological defense mechanisms so that humane people participate in inhumane practices without fully realizing what they are doing. In other words, carnism teaches us how not to feel. Now the primary defense of carnism is denial. If we deny there's a problem in the first place, then we don't have to do anything about it. Denial is expressed largely through invisibility. One way carnism remains invisible is by remaining unnamed. If we don't name it, we can't even think about it. So we can't question it or challenge it. The invisibility of carnism is why eating animals appears to be a given rather than a choice. But carnism also keeps its victims out of sight and therefore conveniently out of public consciousness. And of course, if the problem is invisible, then there will be ethical invisibility. Now, carnism is an entire system of victimization. It victimizes all of us in different ways. But before I talk about the invisible victims of carnism, I want to do another quick exercise with you to demonstrate the power and scope of invisibility. And this one is a fill in the blank. I'd like you to try to guess. 1911, 19,011 farmed animals. This is only land animals. If it included aquatic life, this number could be quintupled. Are killed in the United States for their flesh and excretions every, what do you think? Month? I heard a lot of hours. Week? This is just the United States, not globally. Day, some people said day. A lot of hours here in this room minute. The source goes under minute, so we are left with that as the last one. If you guessed minute, you guessed correctly. That adds up to approximately 10 million animals per year, land animals. So in the time it took us to do this exercise, nearly 20,000 animals were slaughtered in our own backyard. But think about it. How many farmed animals have you seen? Just really take a minute to think about it. Just this week, how many of these 20,000 a minute have you seen this month or this year? How many of these billions upon billions of beings have you even seen in your lifetime? I mean, just to put this number into perspective, think about how many people you see on any given day. <laughs> and the US population of farmed animals is 32 times that of the human population. So, where are they? I mean, given that these animals' body parts and excretions are literally everywhere we turn, why don't we ever see them alive? Well, of course, right? We don't see our, the animals whose bodies become our food because we're not supposed to. They are not, as carnistic industry would have us believe, living on happy mom and pop farms. I know, I know, this, this slide had a caption that read happy cow when it was a picture online, and I have found out that it's really a creepy cow, I know. <laughs> I, always, I always think of this as having that clown effect, right? It's supposed to make you laugh, but it really scares you a little bit. <laughs> you, you get what I'm talking about. <laughs> Over 99% of the meat, eggs, and dairy that make it to our plates come from animals who were raised in, in CAFOs and factory farms, windowless sheds in remote locations that are virtually impossible for anyone other than industry insiders to obtain access to. And if you did try to obtain access to one of these compounds, you could find yourself in prison thanks to a number of so-called ag-gag laws that are now popping up to protect industry. For instance, we have the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. Attorney and author of Muzzling a Movement, Daryl Lovitz, explains that the AETA states that one has committed the federal crime of terrorism if they engage in any activity that may reduce the profits of an animal enterprise. 
And I've mentioned that I'm giving this talk around the world. These ad gag laws are popping up because the, the vegan movement is becoming increasingly powerful around the world. So is the repression against exposure um, and exposing the system. So just who are these individuals that Carnistic Industry works so hard to hide from us? I'm going to show you a very um, short video narrated by Dr. Jonathan Balcom, who some of you may know. He's an animal behaviorist um, who has written 40 scientific papers and four books on animal cognition that offers a rare glimpse into their inner lives. And many of the individuals in this video are residents of Farm Sanctuary, which is the, the nation's leading farmed animal protection organization. Pigs are curious, playful, and at least as intelligent as dogs. I often kneel down next to one of the pigs, maybe Peapod or Petunia, lazing in the thick hay of their barn. I scratch their heads and rub their bellies. Most pigs will make an effort to reposition themselves to expose more of their belly for scratching and rubbing. This simple act says, that feels good. Chickens and turkeys are social birds with a vocabulary of distinctive calls and the ability to recognize other individuals in their flock by their appearance and their voice. Chickens and turkeys also show virtuous behavior. For example, both species use alarm calls to signal the approach of a dangerous predator. Whoever sounds the alarm draws attention to him or herself, but they bravely do it for the flock. A rooster will often call a hen and offer her food, either by pointing to the or by offering it in his beak. Well-nurtured calves are happy and confident, and their mothers go to great lengths to ensure their care. For instance, veterinarian Holly Cheever was once called out to a dairy when a cow mysteriously stopped producing milk. The cow had recently delivered her fifth baby out in the pasture, and as usual, her calf was taken away from her as soon as she led the calf back to the milking barn. Normally, a milked cow produces over 12 gallons per day, but this cow returned from the pasture every evening with an empty udder. Eleven days later, it was discovered she had produced twins. Having lost four previous babies, the mother cow had made a painful choice to allow one of her children to be taken so she could hide the other in the woods. Fishes are grossly misunderstood. Careful scientific studies show that they experience pain, that they recognize other individuals, and they have preferred mates. Lobsters and crabs show responses to painful stimuli that indicate the experience of pain. This information has convinced some regions to enact anti-cruelty laws banning the practice of boiling lobsters alive. There is no longer any reasonable doubt that animals think and feel and that they have rich emotional and social lives. Yeah, I know, I know. Some of, uh, some of those were just lovely. Um, and unfortunately, Farm Sanctuary is uh, home to only a tiny minority of uh, farmed animals. And in a moment, I'm going to show you another very short video that offers a rear glimpse into the inner lives of the 99%. Uh, but before I do, I want to just give you a quick heads up. Um, the video that I'm going to show can be distressing to witness. And I just want to remind you that my goal here today is not to distress you, it's to raise awareness. And to do that, I've got to make the invisible visible. So I've selected, I spent a lot of time selecting material that I felt was sufficient to inform without actually traumatizing you. Um, and so I really want to encourage you to, to witness this video um, because I really believe that the empowerment that awareness ultimately brings is well worth the few seconds of discomfort that you may feel. And this is feedback I've gotten from people, thousands of people over the years who have seen this presentation. But I also want to encourage you to witness yourself. For some of you, it might be too much. You may have seen this already before. Um, it's only four minutes long. Um, but you know, just plug your ears, close your eyes, and I'll keep the uh, sound low enough so you can block most of it out if you need to. And this is undercover footage in uh, animal factories. Mother sows are locked in narrow metal stalls barely larger than their own bodies. Soon after birth, piglets are castrated by workers who cut into their skin and rip out their testicles. Next, the workers chop off their tails. Both of these painful procedures are nearly always done without anesthesia. Others are killed by being slammed headfirst into the ground. Once pigs have reached market weight, they are sent to slaughter. At the slaughterhouse, pigs are knocked in the head with a steel rod, hung upside down, and have their throats slit. 
Copper Stunning condemns many pigs to having their throats slit while they are fully conscious and suffering. Because male chicks don't lay eggs and do not grow quickly enough to be raised profitably for meat, they are killed within hours after hatching. Male chicks are typically thrown into giant grinding machines while still alive. This practice is deemed standard and acceptable by the egg industry. The females have it even worse, destined for a life of prolonged cruelty. To reduce pecking induced by overcrowded living conditions, workers use a hot blade or laser to remove part of the chick's beaks. After debeaking, the birds are moved to cages where they will spend the rest of their lives. Nearly 95% of egg-laying hens spend their lives confined in tiny wire cages like this. Through genetic selection, chickens and turkeys raised for meat have been bred to grow so large so quickly that many suffer crippling leg disorders, chronic joint pain, and even fatal heart attacks. Those who live to reach market weight are thrown into transport crates and loaded onto trucks bound for slaughter plants. At the slaughter plant, the birds are dumped from their crates, then roughly snapped upside down into moving shackles by their fragile legs. They are then pulled across a blade which slices their throats, causing blood to pour from their necks. Calves on dairy farms are dragged away from their mothers and violently killed, all so that humans can have the milk instead. The majority of today's dairy cows are confined on factory farms. Workers subject young cows to painful mutilations and amputations. At a fraction of their natural lifespan, the so-called spent dairy cows are prodded onto transport trucks and shipped to slaughterhouses. Unreliable stunning practices at the slaughterhouse condemn many cattle to having their throats cut and their limbs hacked off while still alive and conscious. Undercover investigations at kosher slaughterhouses in the United States have documented the routine practice of cutting open the throats of fully aware and alert cattle. Massive trawling nets indiscriminately drag hundreds of tons of fish and other animals along the ocean floor. They are then tossed on board where the surviving fish either suffocate or are crushed to death. Others are still alive when they are hacked apart on these floating slaughterhouses. Like factory farmed animals on land, farm raised fish are crowded by the tens of thousands in small disease and excrement ridden areas for their entire lives. When fish reach market weight, they are loaded onto tanker trucks and shipped to slaughter, where common killing methods include slow suffocation. Hey, um, good job. I know how hard that is. It's still incredibly difficult for me to witness this. It's amazing. This is four minutes out of an entire hour presentation, and it always feels like the longest part of the presentation. So thank you for choosing to bear witness um, to this. Um, before we move on, I want to just point out quickly that much of what you have seen here are in fact standard industry practices that apply to so-called free-range and organic facilities as well. So, you know, whenever people witness the truth about animal agriculture, you know, they always ask me, Melanie, how is this legal? And I reply that, you know, not only is it legal, there's an entire industrial complex built around this kind of violence and slaughter. The animal agribusiness in the United States is a $125 billion industry. There are countless companies, just like this one, selling a castrator and a masculator as, as though it were a nail clipper. You could even buy a castrator on eBay if you really wanted to, believe it or not, which is where I bought mine. <laughs> Here. 
airport security didn't laugh yesterday when I tried to say the same thing. Um, so yes, before you make assumptions about what kind of woman I am, yes, I have a castrator in my purse. Um, as I mentioned, I um, travel the world giving this presentation, and um, I, I feel it's very important to have something tangible to show and not just have images on slides. And I actually spent months trying to find something to bring with me, but I can't take anything sharp on airplanes, and I can't take anything too large, and so I wound up buying a castrator. Um, it's a crush castrator, like you see up there, used on baby animals, piglets, and um, uh, sheep, I believe, actually. I, I can tell you, getting through airport security has taken on a whole new dimension for me, and a whole new level of humiliation, actually. And I have this terrible fear that, you know, I always say this, I'm gonna be on a date one day and have left this in my purse and, you know, go for my wallet. And it's, I have stories I could share, but we don't have time for that right now. Uh, but it gives you an idea of the absurdity and the insanity of this system. So you know, clearly the animals pay dearly for our carnism. But as I mentioned, animals are not the only victims of the system. Another set of victims are the meat packers and slaughterhouse workers, many of whom are non-English speaking immigrants, documented and undocumented, who can't advocate for their rights, who work in a highly dangerous, death-saturated environment, and, and not surprisingly have been found to have high rates of post-traumatic stress and addictions. Just very quickly, to give you a sense of what these people have to contend with, I'm going to share with you three titles of OSHA ac accident reports out of about, you know, between 30 and 40 I had to choose from. Can you read in the back? Is it large enough or do you want me to read it out loud? Read it out loud. Some people are saying yes, okay. Um, employee hospitalized for neck laceration from flying blade. Employee's eye injured when struck by hanging hook. Employee decapitated by chain of hide puller machine. It, it's shocking, but it makes perfect sense when we think about this industry. In fact, in 2005, for the first time ever, Human Rights Watch issued a report criticizing a single US industry, the meat industry, for working conditions so appalling they violate basic human rights. And as we've already been discussing today, our environment is an invisible victim of carnism. The UN has stated that animal agriculture is, quote, one of the most significant contributors to the most serious environmental problems facing the world today. And we are the invisible victims of carnism. We pay for our carnism with our health, as eating animals has been linked with the leading diseases in the Western world today. The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which used to be called the American Dietetic Association, has issued a report stating that not only are vegan diets nutritionally adequate, but they're actually beneficial in the treatment and prevention of disease. And we pay for our carnism with our taxes, billions of dollars a year in meat subsidies. Subsidies that have been criticized across the political spectrum as one of the most egregious corporate welfare programs in the history of the country. And we pay for our carnism with our hearts and with our minds. Because to eat the body or excretions of another sentient being, we've got to block our awareness and shut down our empathy. We pay for our carnism with the gap in our consciousness. So we've talked a lot about denial expressed through invisibility, the primary defense of the system. But do you think invisibility alone is enough to maintain the entire system, if you think about it? I mean, of course not. Hints of the truth surround us. You know, the, the palpable vein in the drumstick, the hog on a spit at the company barbecue, vegan guests at dinner parties, and an endless array of dead animals everywhere we turn in the form of meat. So when invisibility inevitably falters, we need to be able to justify eating animals. And the way that we learn to justify eating animals is by learning to believe that the myths of meat, eggs, and dairy are the facts of meat, eggs, and dairy. Now there's a vast mythology surrounding eating animals, but all of these myths fall under, uh, in one way or another under what I refer to as the three ends of justification. If you had to guess what they are, what do you think they would be? I love doing this exercise, I love it. You're absolutely right. Eating animals is normal, natural, and necessary. And I have done this with thousands of people over a number of years around the world, and everybody gets it, audiences get it in seconds. Because we've heard it all before. These very same arguments have been used to justify violent practices throughout the course of human history. 
Can you see in the back or do you need me to read it? Slavery. Male dominance is normal, natural, and necessary. Heterosexual supremacy. Well, let's look at each of these myths just briefly in turn. Eating meat, eggs, and dairy is normal. Well, what we call normal is simply the beliefs and behaviors of the dominant culture. It is the carnistic norm. And carnism as a social norm is so entrenched that it, it's virtually impossible to see unless we step outside the box. So to help explain this concept, I want to do another quick thought experiment with you. I'd like you to imagine that you are back at that dinner party where your host has just told you you're eating a golden retriever. But now imagine that you tell your host how you feel. And she replies by saying, don't worry, don't feel bad. The dog had a good life. She was able to run and play, and she even formed friendships with some other golden retrievers and some people before she was killed at six months old. Is it any easier to eat the golden retriever? In some ways, it's harder, right? She had a life that she was enjoying. So, so ask yourself, if you would be opposed to a perfectly healthy golden retriever being killed, simply because people like the way her thighs taste, why might you not be opposed to the exact same thing being done to somebody else? Carnism as a social norm is so entrenched that it blinds us to the fact that so-called humane meat, eggs, and dairy is a myth. It is a myth constructed by those in the business of violence to appeal to those of us who would ordinarily never support such violence. Okay, eating meat is natural. Well, what we call natural is simply the dominant culture's interpretation of history. It refers not to human history, but to carnistic history. It references not our fruit-eating ancestors, but their flesh-eating descendants. In other words, we only look as far back as we need to to justify our current carnistic practices. And to be fair, murder, rape, and infanticide are arguably as long-standing and therefore as natural as eating animals, and yet we don't invoke the longevity of these practices as a justification for them today. And finally, eating meat is necessary. Well, what we call necessary is simply what's necessary to maintain the dominant culture, to maintain the carnistic status quo. And here I'm just going to let a picture speak for itself. For people in the back, this is a kill counter, the animal kill counter. It's counting up the number of animals that have been killed globally since I opened this slide, and we are up to 20,000 chickens. 2,000 ducks, I can't, I can't keep up with it. Um, you, get this, you get the idea. Now a related myth to eating meat is necessary is the protein myth. The idea that we can't get protein unless we eat it through animals who have already eaten before us. But this, of course, is a complete myth. In fact, did you know that you could be strong enough to lift a car without having eaten an ounce of animal protein in your entire life? Would I lie to you? <laughs> you know, looking back on my own resistance to witnessing the truth about eating animals, I could see how the myths had a tremendous influence on me, as they do on all of us. I couldn't close that gap in my consciousness until I was ready to make the behavioral change that would inevitably follow. And I couldn't make that change until I felt safe enough to do so. I had a lot of fears and concerns. Would I get sick? Would I go broke buying expensive vegan foods? Would I have to subsist on a diet of tofu and cardboard? And what about my relationships? I mean, my father was, he, he is today, a, a charter captain. He's, my father's a professional fisherman. My uncle has been an avid hunter his entire life. My Jewish stepmother made the best matzo ball soup this side of the equator. My Italian nana thrived on stuffing us full of her lasagna marinara. And my half Lebanese mother served an Arabic lamb dish as the centerpiece for every special occasion. So what would happen if I rejected the traditions that bonded me to my family? Now what I didn't realize back then was that although change is always somewhat scary, and changing ingrained behaviors is always somewhat challenging, that this kind of change would also be tremendously empowering. And I didn't realize that a lot of my fears were unfounded, that I would be healthier today at 46 than I was when, thank you, um, that I was when I was half my age. 
I didn't realize that I would be able to cook and eat even more abundantly. And I didn't realize that the deepest bonds with others are forged not through unquestioningly following the dictates of tradition, but be by becoming the kind of person who practices authenticity and integrity, the cornerstones of meaningful relationships. John F. Kennedy once said that belief in myths allows the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. JFK did not underestimate the power of myths, and neither should we, because the myths of meat prevail, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. And they prevail largely because the system is so entrenched. It's embraced and maintained by all major social institutions, from the family to the state. It's become self-perpetuating. This idea of an entrenched system is summed up nicely by a 19th century French political economist who said, when plunder becomes a way of life, we create for ourselves, in the course of time, a legal system that authorizes it and a moral code that glorifies it. And when we are born into an entrenched system such as carnism, we inevitably absorb that system's logic as our own. In other words, we internalize carnism. We learn to look at the world through the lens of carnism. And carnism uses a set of defenses that distort our perceptions of meat, eggs, dairy, and the animals we eat so that we can be comfortable enough to consume them. For instance, carnism teaches us to see animals as objects. So we learn to refer to this turkey as something rather than someone, or to call this little baby an it, a thing, rather than he or she. Carnism teaches us to see animals as abstractions, as lacking in any individuality or personality of their own, and instead simply as abstract members of a group. A pig is a pig, and all pigs are the same. And like other victims of violent ideologies, we give them numbers rather than names. For instance, a meat cutter I interviewed for my doctoral dissertation said this to me. I don't think of farmed animals as individuals. I wouldn't be able to do my job if I got that personal with them. When you say individuals, you mean as a unique person, as a unique thing with its own name and its own characteristics, its own little games that it plays? Yeah? Yeah, I'd really rather not know that. I'm sure it has it, but I'd rather not know it. And carnism teaches us to place animals in rigid categories in our minds so that we can harbor very different feelings and carry out very different behaviors toward different species. For instance, a female meat eater I interviewed told me that she regularly consumes a variety of types of meats. And when I asked her if she ate veal, she stopped and looked at me with this very offended expression on her face. It got very quiet. And then she said, well, let's just say I came to your house and you told me that I had just eaten veal I'd probably vomit, like, I have to get that out of my system. When I asked her why, she said, because veal comes from a baby. I can't eat a baby. When we look at the world through the lens of carnism, we fail to see the absurdities of the system. So we see images like this or like this, someone mutilating their own body to be eaten. And we take no notice rather than take offense. We see images like this or like this, and we laugh rather than cry. Voltaire was right. If we believe absurdities, we <coughs> shall commit atrocities. And carnism is but one of the many atrocities, one of the many violent ideologies that are an unfortunate part of the human legacy. And although the experience of each set of victims will always be somewhat unique, the ideologies themselves are structurally similar because the mentality that enables such violence is the same. It is the mentality of domination and subjugation, of privilege and oppression. It's the mentality that causes us to turn someone into something, to reduce a life to a unit of production, to erase someone's being. It is the might makes right mentality that makes us feel entitled to wield complete control over the lives and deaths of those with less power just because we can, and to feel justified in our actions because they're only savages, women, animals, 
It is the mentality of meat. And so if we fail to pick out the common threads that are woven through all violent ideologies, then we will be doomed to just recreate atrocities in new forms. This is why it is critical that we incorporate all oppressive systems into our analysis, including carnism. Eating animals is not simply a matter of personal ethics. It is the inevitable end result of a deeply entrenched oppress oppressive-ism. Eating animals is a social justice issue. Martin Luther King understood the ways in which oppressive systems reinforce one another. He wisely cautioned that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And the opposite is also true. Justice anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. And justice is not an abstract concept. It's a practice. A practice that can be carried out anywhere, on the streets of a nation's capital, in a courtroom, in a YWCA. And we can also practice justice on our plates. So this brings us to the third and final part of this presentation. Knowing what we know about the problem of carnism, what do we do about it? What is the solution to the gap? I want to address this question with another question for you. What do you think is the reason that we use carnistic defenses in the first place? Anyone want to take a quick guess? That's right, that's exactly right, because we care. We care about animals, we care about the truth, and carnism depends on our not caring, and the system is built on deception. I've been talking about the issue of eating animals 20 years now, and I almost never encounter a person who doesn't cringe when faced with images of animal suffering. So the good news is that carnism is a house of cards. It is a vulnerable system that needs a strong fortress to protect itself from its very own proponents, us. I mean, why else would we go through all the psychological gymnastics if not because we care? And so our caring is both the problem and the solution. Our caring is what makes us want to turn away from the truth. But our caring is also what gives us the courage to face the truth, the courage to bear witness. When we bear witness, we identify with another. We see something of ourselves in them and something of them in ourselves. Even if the only thing we identify with is the desire not to suffer. When we bear witness, we empathize with another. We look at the world through their eyes so that when we make choices that impact them, we ask ourselves, what would he or she ask us to do? When we bear witness, we make the connection. We close that gap in our consciousness and we become more empowered because we become more whole, more integrated. We're more connected to and in alignment with our core values. Values such as compassion, reciprocity, the golden rule, and justice. Values that are diametrically opposed to carnism. And we therefore practice greater integrity. Integrity is the integration of values and practices. Witnessing can take so many forms. I mean, think about the AIDS quilt. Has anyone here ever seen that? It's amazing. Amazing. The Vietnam Memorial Wall, another great act of witnessing. The revolutionary music of the 60s. Witnessing can be writing or not writing a check in the name of justice. It can be standing on a street corner handing out pamphlets or starting a task force. Witnessing can be hosting or presenting or attending a slideshow. And if you think about it, throughout the history of humankind, virtually every atrocity was made possible because the populace turned away from a reality that they felt was too painful to face. And virtually every revolution, every social transformation was made possible because a group of people chose to bear witness and they demanded that others bear witness as well. For instance, just consider the countless witnesses, the conscientious objectors throughout history. Some who have been famous, but most who have been the unsung heroes of social transformation. This transformative potential of collective witnessing is why oppressive systems such as carnism must deny the truth about the social movements 
that challenge them. For example, proponents of the movements are portrayed as biased and extremist when they challenge the biases and extreme practices of the dominant culture. Or they're portrayed as overly emotional and sensationalist when they challenge the apathy and numbing of the dominant culture. If we shoot the messenger, we don't have to take seriously the implications of his or her message. And the true power and scope of the social movement is minimized or obscured. So this is why, despite what mainstream carnistic culture would have us believe, there is reason to be very, very hopeful. Because the vegan movement, which is the counterpoint to carnism, is actually thriving. For example, between 2008 and 2011, the number of vegetarians and vegans in the United States has actually doubled, and this is a trend I am seeing all over the world when I travel. A recent Business Week article entitled The Rise of the Power of Vegans has stated that a growing number of America's most powerful bosses have become vegan. More and more leaders and celebrities are saying no to carnism. Ellen even has her own website dedicated entirely to going vegan. Vegan cookbooks and innovative foods and restaurants are popping up everywhere. I have this incredibly privileged position where I travel around the world having this conversation. Everywhere I go, the movement is just exploding. One of the ways that oppressive systems maintain themselves is by cultivating despair in those on the front lines of the movement, by making those on the front lines of the movement believe that they are not as effective as they actually are, and I can assure you that that is not the fact when it comes to the vegan movement. The trajectory is heading up, and I don't see it slowing any time in the near future, if at all. So, oh, thank you. So, moving beyond carnism enables us to step into a vibrant, vibrant community of millions of people who seek to celebrate life and cultivate compassion. It, it enables us to become a part of something greater than our individual selves. And so coming full circle, back to the 1970s, Fritz, my first dog, was in many ways also my first teacher. Fritz taught me that love, which is the highest form of connection and the highest expression of justice, shouldn't be limited by arbitrary boundaries, such as species. To love someone is to respect their being. It's to respect that no matter how different from us they are, they have a life that matters to them. Fritz taught me to be a witness. He taught me that love is a verb. And so this is why the goal of my presentation here today and the goal of my life's work has been to raise awareness of the violent system that is carnism. Because for better or worse, we are all participants in the system. So our choice is not whether we participate, but how we participate. With awareness, we can choose to be active witnesses rather than passive bystanders. With awareness, we can lead more authentic and freely chosen lives. And truly become, as Gandhi said, the change we wish to see. Thank you. Thank you. all of you, if you have a chance, to visit carnism.com. This is my website for Carnism Awareness and Action Network. There are lots of resources for people, regardless of what your dietary orientation is, whether you're a vegan, vegetarian, or somewhere in between, or somewhere nowhere near that. Um, we have lots of resources. I also have some of my books here that um, I'm going to have like five minutes to maybe uh, sign if you're interested later, and they'll be in the front room over there after the panel discussion. Okay, thank you all. Thank you.